Well, hello, how are you doing? Uh, it's just gone nine o'clock here in uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland. And I hope you're staying safe and well wherever you are in the world. Um, as you know, I've been reading my uh, from my memoirs during lockdown here. And we're into the what looks like the final week of full lockdown here in Northern Ireland. So this is going to be my last week of that reading um uh, reading each each weekday evening and as it happens actually I have five chapters left of All Grown Up uh, to read so I'm going to continue this evening uh, and uh, yeah we're up to chapter 16 tonight and um, so this evening it's a bit of a well it's a, there's a bit of humour at the start but it's a bit of a sad chapter this one um, but I hope you enjoy it and uh, it's entitled chapter 16 Farewell to Big Isabel Life, the universe, and everything were just as complex as in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, so they were. I found that late night debates over yellow pack coffee in student digs were a good place to increase my understanding of the big issues of life, death, world hunger, and the possibility of intergalactic travel. Students proposed very sensible solutions to the world's problems between midnight and 2am. Though after this time, the discussions usually deteriorated into stupid arguments or just plain slabbering. Byron Drake knew everything about everything, especially late at night when I suspected he had been smoking marijuana again. No offence, Tone, but I can't believe that in the 20th century, someone like you could reach the age of 20 and have so little experience of life, said Byron, breathing heavily into his Yasser Arafat scarf in an attempt to create some heat in his freezing flat. 21, I said, cupping my hands around a tepid CND mug. And you haven't had sex yet either. Don't comment on things you know nothing about, Tone. Well, I've yet to see you even gone out with a wee girl. At least I can snog Leslie any day of the week, apart from weekends when I go home to get my washing done. Listen, Tone, I date women from England, not wee girls from Ireland. And what happens in the sack in Essex stays in Essex. Byron said cryptically. I was confused. Why would anyone want to have sex in a sack? I remember doing sack races on sports day at school and the sack was always dead itchy on your skin so it was bound to wreak havoc with your Jimmy Joe. Okay then tell me about the last time you had sex I said. Byron tapped his nose seriously. I know how to please a woman in every conceivable direction. I wanted to repeat the words of Duran Duran. Please, please tell me now. Is there something I should know? But I wasn't prepared to give Byron the pleasure of knowing he knew more than me, even though he already knew he knew more. Every direction? Like, do you need to use a compass? Ha oh, ha, oh, very droll, Tone, very droll. Let's just say the women I make love to have no complaints. I in your dreams, big lad, I said, noticing once again how working class I sounded when I had an argument with Byron. I accepted that I had lived a very sheltered life growing up on the Shankill Road in the 1970s, but I wasn't as naive as Byron thought. It was true I had no significant personal experience of sex, but I was certain I could get a chance at some stage in the next decade. Life is not an episode of Doctor Fucking Who. You know that tone, Byron said, letting his ginger fringe flop over one eye. I was appalled that anyone would dare to use the F word when referring to Doctor Who. This was just as bad as the time my big brother said shite during one of his increasingly rare appearances at church. He used the offending adjective during a solo of How Great Thou Art, and while I disagreed, while I agreed with his critique of the soprano's performance, this sort of language was completely unacceptable. 
Byron went on to suggest that I needed to listen to the Smith's latest album because Morrissey had something really, really dark and really, really deep to say to our generation that would awaken me both intellectually and sexually. While he was explaining how Morrissey's songs were almost Nietzschean, I fell asleep. Benny and Bjorn had awakened me to the fact that the history book on the shelf is always repeating itself. But apart from this, it was becoming clear how little I really knew about life. I wasn't too familiar with death either. Apart from the normal day-to-day -day deaths of the Troubles, I had very little experience of it. Our neighbour, Mr Oliver, had been murdered by cheering gunmen in our street and apparently I had a twin brother and sister who were still born. But I didn't know them personally, so apart from the nightmares I had about them, these deaths had very little impact of me. Of course, I had extensive experience of animal death due to my inability to keep alive any of my pets I purchased to date, but my primary understanding of human death came from the news and the horror movies I saw on TV. These sources provided plenty of good advice on how to avoid death. I learned not to walk past an empty car with its headlights on in Belfast city centre and I knew that it was unwise to walk across the peace line after dark. I knew that whenever I was stopped by wee hoods and asked if I was Protestant or a Catholic it was best to answer according to which side I thought they were from rather than give a truthful and potentially fatal answer. I also understood the dangers of having a shower in a motel room in America and that it was unwise to explore a deserted castle in Transylvania when you're far from the nearest town and your car has run out of petrol. Furthermore, thanks to the work of Ridley Scott, I was fully aware of the potential dangers lurking on derelict alien spacecraft, especially when you were about to go into stasis. I knew how to avoid deaths all right, but I had no idea how to deal with grief. I was as upset as everyone else when Captain Mannering and Sergeant Wilson and Grace Kelly died in quick succession. I was upset for months after Adric died, helping the doctor to stop a freighter controlled by the Cybermen from crashing into planet Earth. However, I had not experienced proper grief until my grandparents started to die. So I'll continue the chapter in a wee minute, but before I do that, I'll just say hello. Who's saying hello to me this evening? Good evening, Donna Hunter. Good to have you along this evening. One of my regulars. And Evelyn Brown. Hi, how are you? Again, Angela and Keith Montgomery never miss. Good to have you along as usual. Um, uh, Linda, Har Linda Hardy says, what's your t-shirt? Oh, that's my, that's my swanky t-shirt. It's a designer one. Leslie would be so embarrassed that I can't remember which one it is. If she's watching, she might tell me. I can't remember. It's a swanky designer t-shirt. Oh, no, I can't remember. <laughs> She'd be mortified that I don't even know that, that, that this design is is iconic, that design. Can't remember. Anyway, hello, Norma Fleming. How you doing? Good evening, Marlene Williamson. Lovely to have you. And Bernadette, Bernadette Saunders. Yes, book lover. I like your wee emoji there. Good evening, Anne Kirk and Sadie Hanna. More, more regulars and greetings for another night, says Marty McCauley. Great to have you all along. Hi, Betty O'Reardon and Jim Poole. Uh, hi, Francis McGrath. Good to have you back on, Monday, uh, on a Monday. Hello, Neve Sahafian and Sadie Hanna. And uh, Michael McKinley Sr. Uh, <laughs> he says, after 9pm on Friday, I'll have to start talking to Joyce again. <laughs> That's good, you see, that's, that's, no, that's healthy. That's, that's okay, instead of listening to me slabbering. Okay, uh, hi, Ivy and uh, Dee, and uh, Donna says I'm a poser. Yes, definitely. I still can't remember the name of it. And, uh, and Anne writing, hello, good to have you all along. So, um, yeah, so I'm reading chapter 16, and uh, it's a bit of a sad chapter. My father's father had died when I was too young to remember. Everyone said he was a real gentleman. He'd played cricket for Woodville Cricket Club in Ireland. My Auntie Hetty still had his international cricket cap and her roof space, and my brothers had both inherited his cricketing genes. My father's mother was known as Nanny, and she was a proper granny with kisses and presents and nice blue cardigans and false teeth and knitting. 
When she died, everyone was very sad and I'd never seen so many adults cry. But Nanny was old and tired and her passing seemed natural. When my great auntie Doris with the pearls and proper accent died, it was very sad too. But she was even older than Nanny. Everyone said she had been a real lady and very glamorous in her youth, but that she'd been away with the birds for a few years. On her deathbed, she kept repeating a verse from Psalm 23, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, which didn't sound like being away with the birds to me. When my mother's father died, it was traumatic for my mother and the whole family. We Francie had worked in the bookies for most of his life and loved a wee stout. He retired to be a security man on the door of the local pub, and my mother always worried what would happen to him if the IRA decided to blow up the pub. Grando was also very old and seemed quite fed up, but he died after his bed caught fire while he was having a wee smoke and everyone was just as upset about the way he had gone as the fact he had gone. I was late for the funeral because I'd misjudged how long it would take me to drive to Brown's funeral parlour on the Lisburn Road. You'll be late for your own bloody funeral, my mother had said through her tears. The passing of my first three grandparents was very sad. Waking up and remembering that Nanny and Granda were gone forever was my first taste of grief. And when I saw my parents' obvious distress, I couldn't help but wonder how I would cope without them when it was their turn in 40 years' time. That's us moving up into the first division now, my uncle Sammy said to my father at Nanny's funeral. In many ways, Big Isabel was the biggest grandparent in my life, aside from her physical proportions. She was the family matriarch, an enormous personality and an important part of my life for as long as I could remember. My earliest memories were of getting the bus down the Springfield Road to visit her and holding my mother's hand as we walked up Roden Street long before they built the West Link motorway through the middle of it to make a peace line. I must have been only four years old when Granny gave me a shilling to go round to Mrs Adair's wee sweetie shop for a lucky bag and a sherbet dip. Every time I visited Granny's house, I would check if the tiny toy soldier I had found in my lucky bag was still irretrievably stuck between the paving stones in her minuscule front garden. I remember the days we arrived while Granny was out at the shops buying a nice ham shank for Granda's dinner. I was amazed when my mother simply reached into the letter box to find the front door key dangling on a piece of dirty string and let us in. Big Isabel knew everything about me and I knew nearly everything about her, including some of her more intimate medical conditions, which I didn't want to know about. Granny spoke of mysterious ailments like the change, trouble with the waterworks and problems in the back entry and she swore by the healing properties of Valium when you were bad with your nerves or your head was turned. The thought of Big Isabel passing away was difficult to contemplate, in spite of the fact that for as long as I could remember, she had been saying, I'm in my coffin already, love. They just can't get the lid on. Every time I'd been to visit her since I started university, she remarked that I was all grown up now. And ever since meeting Leslie, she always made sure to inquire about the state of our relationship. How's the big Leslie girl, love? She would ask. I dead on, Granny, I would reply briefly. In the name of God, don't you go having a wee notion of none of them other wee hussies up there in cold rain and breaking that wee girl's heart, was her sage advice. I was shocked at Granny's doubts regarding my loyalty to Leslie, and she could read this in my face. And don't be looking at me with the face tripping you neither. You wouldn't be the first Holy Joe to run off with some wee here. I wasn't sure whether to use my spiritual or feminist credentials to argue that I was not a Holy Joe, but I decided not to bother as Big Isabel would just accuse me of getting all swanky on her again. Since the age of four, she had distinguished me from the other grandchildren by describing me as the wee swanky one. Oh, wise up, Granny, you're scundering me, I said, prompting an enormous hug from Big Isabel and a typically hearty laugh that made her sofa shake. And don't you be getting that wee girl into trouble, neither, she warned. 
I was astounded at how she could move from suspicions of infidelity to concerns of unplanned pregnancy in a matter of seconds. Given her volatile temperament, this was a good outcome from an exchange with my granny. She was not averse to shouting at you to get out of the house and never darken my door again because you'd questioned the morality of hiding behind the sofa and pretending no one was in when her tick man called. She would often threaten violence when upset. On more than one occasion, she offended my pacifist sensibilities by threatening to draw my hand across your beak, you cheeky wee hagin, simply because I refused to run the wee brush over the carpet, love. This place is starting to look like a real donder and inn. Big Isabel was quite outspoken on political and constitutional matters too. Well, if it wasn't for the big fella, we'd have been sold down the river long ago, was her analysis of the achievements of the Reverend Ian Paisley. According to her, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, James Pryor, had a face on him like a scalped arse. And of course, Jerry Adams had the sort of bake you'd never get tired kicking. Granny also had her own distinctive views on art and culture. She was a dedicated viewer of Crossroads and she was completely intolerant of any talking in the room during an episode of Coronation Street. Frequently tell us to shut your bakes while Coronation Street's on or I'll warn the ears of the whole bloody laddies. Big Isabel was also very excited about a new Irish country and western singer from Donegal called Daniel O'Donnell, who she said was a lovely wee fella and he's good as mama. Though her less favourable musical reviews could be quite cotton. Look at the neb on your man on the piano, was her description of Barry Manilow. As for Boy George, for the love and honour of Peg's gravy, what is the world coming to? Would you look at the cut of on wee lad all dressed up like some wee doll? Big Isabel was so full of life it was hard to imagine her life coming to an end until that unhappy day finally arrived. It was Leslie's birthday and we'd been on another trip to Dublin for another student leadership training in her Renault 5. As a special treat we had gone to McDonald's in Dublin because you couldn't get a Big Mac in Northern Ireland. I presented Leslie with a padded pink birthday card and a fine gold bracelet from Argus. It had been a truly happy day but when we arrived back at my house in Belfast I noticed that the Venetian blinds in every window were closed even though it was still daylight. This was usually a sign that someone had died in our street so I wondered immediately if something was seriously wrong. I didn't say anything to Leslie in case I was just catastrophizing, but as soon as we entered the house I sensed the gloom. I could hear my mother and my auntie Doris, who was a lovely singer from Lambeg, weeping in the sitting room. My father came out and delivered the bad news. Your granny died this morning, son, he said. I gave my mother the longest hug I had ever given her, and she sobbed on my shoulder, the same way I used to cry on her shoulder when I was a wee boy. There was a steady stream of visitors to our house and plenty of cups of tea and triangular egg and onion sandwiches served by Auntie Emma and Auntie Mabel. Leslie helped with the dishes like she was one of the family and Auntie Doris took the time to admire Leslie's lovely gold bracelet even though she was grieving the loss of her mother. It was strange that Granny had died on Leslie's birthday because I had been born on Big Isabel's birthday. She always said I was her best birthday present ever and when I thought about this I had to go and hide in my room to cry for a while because men weren't supposed to cry. Neighbours and distant relatives I didn't see very often called at the house and everyone said that Is big Isabel was a character so she was and she's in a better place now. God love her. The Reverend Lou called in to shake everyone's hand firmly and say a prayer. He seemed genuinely upset, even though we buried people every day. He always had great crack with Big Isabel, even though her faith was a little unorthodox for a Presbyterian. 
I didn't know anyone else who said they loved the Lord as much as Granny, but in the next breath she would call her neighbour, who you were supposed to love, a slick and wee bastard. It was hard to believe that Big Isabel was really gone, but within a few hours we had visited the funeral home on the Lisburn Road to pay our final respects, and the awful truth began to sink in. My parents and my brothers and I took turns to say our own personal goodbyes to Granny. She was laid out in a small dark room that smelled of death and lilies, with stained glass windows and wooden panelling on the walls. After all those years of hearing her say the words, Big Isabel really was in her coffin, but they hadn't put the lid on yet. When it was my turn, I hesitated at the door and approached the coffin very slowly, half expecting Big Isabel to shout, Come here over here and see me, son, and stop all that footing about over there. Granny looked so still, so quiet and peaceful, but her spirit was not there in the room with me. Her body was just a shell. I felt an overwhelming sadness I had never felt before, and I realised she was gone. Big Isabel was gone. In her own words, she'd gone to the happy hunting ground. My tears dripped onto one of the shiny brass handles on the casket, and when I wiped them away, I caught the reflection of my own sad face, twisted like in one of the crazy mirrors at Barry's amusement in Portrush. I kissed Granny on the forehead and talked to her as if I was four years old again. Thanking her for all the birthday cards, the Christmas presents, the hugs and even the shouting matches. I told her I loved her very much and that she had been a good Granny to me. So she had, in spite of all her old shenanigans. Finally, I said farewell to Big Isabel. So this is grief, I thought. The funeral was not without incident. The church was overflowing with Granny's relatives, friends and neighbours from the Donegal Road, as well as many family friends who all turned out to pay their respects and offer their condolences. There was even a group of mourners from the Westie Disco. There were lots of flowers and handshaking and everyone said they were awful sorry for our loss, even old men I'd never met before. Leslie sat beside me and held my hand during the prayers. The Reverend Lowe led the service and he spoke warmly and personally about Isabel Taylor. It was obvious that he really knew her and really cared about our family's loss. Some ministers just saw burials as a chance to tell a crowd of non-churchgoers to get born again before it was their turn to go to hell. When it came to doing a lift at the coffin, I was one of the first. You're in the second lift, son, Uncle Freddy said. What if I drop her, I thought, panicking. What if I fall over and cause a commotion and let the whole family down? No one had ever explained to me what a lift was or how to do it properly, but I just took the lead from the other men and the undertakers and I managed it all right. Big Isabel weighed over 20 stone and as the edge of the coffin dug into my shoulder, I understood the term dead weight for the first time. I had to put one arm around my big brother's shoulder, something I'd never done before, and hold one of the brass handles with my other hand. As we walked slowly along the wet tarmac road behind the hearse, my right cheek touched the cold polished wood, and it felt as though Granny was kissing me on the cheek one last time. It was at the graveside that Big Isabel, Big Isabel made her final remark. The cemetery smelled of freshly dug earth and freshly cut lilies mixed with the musk of death. After the saddest part of ashes to ashes and dust to dust, the undertakers began lowering the heavy coffin into the grave using large grey straps attached to the brass handles. Suddenly there was a crack and one of the brass handles detached from the coffin. There was a collective gasp from the mourners. The coffin lurched to one side and threatened to topple over. I imagined the, ga the casket flipping over, the lid falling off under Big Isabel's immense weight and Granny diving out of her coffin and into her grave in one final grand gesture. Fortunately, the undertakers imagined a similar disaster and moved quickly to steady the swaying casket. 
For years, Granny had told me she was in her coffin already. They just couldn't get the lid on. Today, it seemed as if she was saying, Look, even when I'm in my coffin, they can hardly keep the lid on. I was sure Big Isabel was watching this from somewhere in her happy hunting ground, laughing one of her great big laughs that made her sofa shake. I was back at university the day after the funeral, getting to grips with an essay on the promotion of capitalism in television game shows. For weeks, my first thought every morning was that Granny was dead. I felt an empty, gnawing feeling in my stomach, and I understood this was loss and grief, and all part of being an adult. It was only when my first thoughts of the morning returned to Leslie and my final exams and Doctor Who that I realised I had emerged from a period of mourning for my dear granny. Dealing with death was a major part of growing up. But ironically, now that Big Isabel was gone, no one would ever tell me again that I was all grown up now, so they wouldn't. So there you are. That is chapter 16 of All Grown Up. So who's been them? Um, who else? Is, let me see what you've been saying to me here. Uh, let me see. Where did I get to the last time? Uh... <laughs> yes, Linda says, so big as a bell foresaw your swanky notions in your swanky t-shirt. Yes, she did indeed. <laughs> I love your granny, says Anne Riding. She was something else. Oh, I went to school in Roden Street, says Janet. Yeah, Roden Street. I know it well. Uh, Irish Explained says, uh, Anne Riding, end of an era. Exactly. The tears are tripping me, so the R says, Marlene. Uh, a moment to know, an R to love, a lifetime to forget, says Anne. That's, that's nice. Very moving, says Susan Craig. Great memory, so well told, Tony. Uh, thanks, says Nigel McComb. Uh, love it, says um, and uh, Mar and Marlene. Uh, lovely, Tony says Orla O'Sullivan. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining me this evening. I'll be back tomorrow night uh, for one of my favourite chapters of All Growed Up. And it's the chapter where I go and visit uh, the lovely Leslie up the country and meet her parents for the first time. So uh, the chapter is called Go Wild in the Country. So that's tomorrow night at nine o'clock. So until then, wherever you are, stay well, stay safe and uh, stay positive. <laughs>